knowledge and information. This is the theme of this year's edition of Global Access. The importance of knowledge has been evident to man since the beginning of time. But the Information Society presents new questions. How does the increasingly intense flow of information affect our ability to maintain a holistic understanding of the world? And does it actually make us smarter or dumber? How can myths and legends which are made up of fantasies still convey knowledge? Jessica Fraser specialises in Indian religion and philosophy. She explores how religious and philosophical concepts differ between cultures. In this conversation with Thomas Gere, Fraser explains the knowledge conveying function of myths within and between cultures. Uh, myths and legends, can we gain some knowledge about them or are just their fairy tales for entertainment? <laughs> um, it depends on the myths and legends, but so many of them were ways that people were able to try and give serious information about the world. In a time in history when you don't have books, you do not have news media, you have no universities, everybody is sitting there in their local village or town or in the middle of the countryside. Mm -hmm. they, have, they know nothing beyond the immediate world they live in. And then either a traveling mistral or bard or, or singer with a smaller yeah. instrument that he can carry around comes yeah. or, an, or an older person tells us about things or maybe mm -hmm. sings or um, some of them are also in in order to remember them yes. uh, metric and, and with rhymes so that they can be easily remembered. This is, this is how narratives are, in a way, transferred from one generation to another, I think. So yeah. is, that, is, that the, is that the, or is that just a romantic picture? <laughs> well, actually, funnily enough, it's something that's very much still alive in many parts of the world. You go to parts of India, um, and of course people can access internet and newspaper now, but still you have the traveling storyteller who comes into town and brings stories with him. And in India, you get, they're called katakas, and they carry often these big pieces of paper or boxes with images that they can use as almost an early form of TV. You don't need electricity. Power you points. can take it anywhere. Exactly, <laughs> PowerPoints. Here's the story, here's the hero, here's the war, here's the demon, here's the happy ending. And so the stories come into town by road, and then the locals, having heard them, can mm. tell them again and again. And sometimes even, I think, I guess, shadow puppets, yeah. Yeah, which exactly. are also a way of telling stories. Yeah. So many kinds, exactly, and people say this about um, stained glass windows in churches, so many kinds of visual art mm. are linked to storytelling, and storytelling is linked to telling us stuff that we just don't know about the world any other way. So, and what do these stories tell when they are story told? Um, well, of course, there are so many different kinds of stories. Um, what is universal about them? Well, any story, I guess, the whole point is that there's a hero. Mm. I mean, go back to go back to Jung, go back to the classic analysts of, of story structure. There's a there's a situation and a problem. There's a hero and a solution and a happy ending, and that tells us something about what humans want to know. They they want to hear about how the world is but then also how people fix things, face problems, uh, come to terms with new situations. And then we're talking actually about epics in a way, ep mm. epical legends. They are, they might, they're like the Odyssea or the, mm. the Iliad of, of, of Western epics, but I guess also Indian epics are, they're even longer, aren't they? They're terribly much longer. Yeah, the world's longest, I think possibly the world's longest text, but certainly the longest of all the epics is the Mahabharata um, in India, which is enormous. It's, uh, we have a set of them in my office. Each volume is this thick and this high in Sanskrit. And there's like 13 or so of them. Uh, just absolutely enormous text. Uh, the beginning of the Mahabharata starts, what is not found here will be found nowhere. Mm. Right? So everything is contained within this super story. It's the encyclopedia of stories. And that, you know, that's one of the things it was meant to do, is tell you everything. But uh, I guess you have similar, like, like mm. you have the, you have the, in, in the in, also in the Chinese culture, the heroes of the marshes or the, uh, the, uh, the three kingdoms, story of the three kingdoms and so forth, which are also enormous. And sometimes one wonders, uh, were people able to remember all this before it came into writing or, or how? It is a very good question. I mean, oral, that's one of the most amazing things when you start to work on ancient literatures is the power of oral literature that people could remember the Mahabharata, the Iliad, which is relatively short in comparison, that these incredible tales were able to be remembered in some cases verbatim, word by word. There's a, there's a memory history in India where people would learn the text forward, 
learn it backwards and be able to recite it in each direction. Learn so it that backwards and really sounding, speaking backwards. Speaking the, speaking the, the words backwards in, in some cases with regard to the Vedas, you have a tradition of even speaking the syllables. And it, what that stops is it's supposed to stop people from adding their own bits. Ah because the of words course. will stay the same. Mm. You know, actually rhyme and verse. Almost all the great epics were songs. We think of songs as pop songs, mm. but great literature was all was sung, it's chanted. Um, and that's so that you can remember it. It's also because it makes it harder to put new words in. Yeah, precisely. You can't just change the metrics and yeah. you have to, yeah. It's a security mm. lock on the text, exactly. <laughs> but I guess there are several dimensions of knowledge in them. First mm. of all, I guess it is the, it is the story itself, which is uh, fun or which is uh, very exciting or which is uh, suspenseful. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, and the stories are wonderful. I mean, you look at the different kinds of stories that you get um, and probably you can take them down to a couple of key themes. You'll get war stories, right? War stories are complicated because actually war itself doesn't make a great story. There's one group, there's another group, they fought. Some, a bunch of people died, someone won. So the war epics you have to turn into deep, complex, messy narratives about motivation and wisdom and justice of war, like the Iliad does this. It's but, about... But you also have to have individual fates within the wars exactly. itself. Exactly. Is that... I mean, we know it from the Iliad or anything from, from, from the fate of Cassandra to Achilles or Patroclus mm. or yeah. other heroes or, or anti-heroes. Are the... Are the are there in myths like that, 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 that there are also individual hero, heroism or indivi individual fates within the large scenario? Yeah, I mean, I think almost maybe that's the key is that every war scenario, every grand political story that's being told, you know, the war, war epics or politics epics, they only work if you have humans at the center. It's like Star Wars. It's, mm. if, it's, if it's a story of a rebellion against an empire, you need those heroes running around having you know, romances, tragedies, aspiration, failure, <gasps> maybe finally victory. But victory only works if you can feel the human victory mm. at the heart of it. And then, but those heroes can also be, of course, individual gods. They don't mm -hmm. need to be humans in this, but and the gods are a yeah. bit, and they have to be a bit humanized, I, I guess. Or? Yeah, it's interesting how god myths work. I completely, I completely agree. You look at the, um, you look at the Greeks and the stories of Venus and Apollo, and uh, not Apollo, Venus and Ares, the war gods. So uh, uh, Aphrodite and Ares mm -hmm. in the in the Greek, Mars and Venus in the in the Roman, and. They're in love, but it's, we don't really know if it's since it's passion, but she's married, but to an ugly guy. And Hephaestus, the, the Vulcan. Exactly, yeah. and they're going to get caught, and what's going to happen? And, and similarly with the Viking, for instance, the Norse myth, mm -hmm. the gods are so human that it really, today I think it makes us question what gods are, were even supposed to be at that time. I mean, they're more problematic than the humans. You get stories of humans trying to be good people. You get relatively few stories of the gods trying to be good people. The gods are a bit immoral, aren't they? When they're not <laughs> immoral even. They, yeah. are, in a way, stay about human yeah. mor moral. They yeah. can do things that are arbitrary or, or on a whim. Yeah, and it reminds you that in the earliest cultures almost everywhere in the world, gods were not about morality. Um, the Western... Abrahamic, post-Hebrew, Hebraic kind of idea, also from the Parsi, um, Zoroastrian culture, that God is a good thing, is not necessarily, I mean, a good thing, is a moral being mm. in the obvious sense who gives you morality. That's actually very recent, and mostly the gods were about powers and forces and understanding the nature of the, the, the world and how it shapes us, not necessarily about kind of how to be good. Mm. Which also, in a way, I guess, gives us the key to the second la layer of knowledge because mm. the myths and legends are also, in a way, about science. Mm. And I, or, or shall we, in, in, a, in a very, um, the word is 
too maybe a normative, primitive way, but or, or, mm-hmm. or at least simplistic way of yeah. this is how the world works. This is mm-hmm. this is how how why it behaves like this. I guess there's there's some kind of scientific knowledge even. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, if if the the political war epics tell us about how to negotiate the complex world of society, you get also those myths. For instance, the creation of the world myths in almost every culture. Which are, what are they trying to tell us? Well, it's not applied knowledge. It's not useful to know how the world was created, but it's useful maybe cognitively to have a sense of the world you're in and where it comes from. And so all these tales of world creation, um, gods who gods who build the world, or eggs that em- from which the world emerges, or divine fiat that divides the chaos into dark and light, sky and earth, or, or you know, and you get gods who. Are we allowed to say this? Gods who masturbate the world into existence. You get gods who um, uh, just Im- Im- make it spill forth out of their own being. Emanationist myths. There's so many different versions of but what reality is. I guess that's is. a way of also giving, in a way, of meaning. Yeah. Or, or, or on the, what, what the meaning of existence or the creation itself. Yeah. And, then I, and also, I guess it's also like answering questions of if we are all created by one God, why do we speak so many different languages? Yes, because yeah. we built this immense tower. And, These things, exactly, mm. exactly, exactly. So many myths. The Indian, one of the Indian myths of creation, something called the Purusha Sukta, an old ancient hymn from the Rig Veda, um, tells about how, as in the Norse myth, the world is created from an early a huge being, the first person. And to create the world, his body and his whole being is turned into the cosmos that we know. And importantly, he's then divided up into head, torso, thighs and feet, and those become the four classes of society, Mm -hmm. right? So social order is explained through this. In other cases, as you say, the seasons may be explained, or I love the myth of Persephone and Hades in the Greek myths, where it, amongst, in a tale of a young girl being kidnapped by, being kidnapped by the god of of the underworld, we also get the explanation of spring and winter. Mm. So so this is... And why the sun shines in the day and the moon shines in the night. There's two lights. and And in China, so many myths explaining flood which is a major, major force yes. in, in that particular landscape and climate. So people are looking, I think you're right, it's, it's science, but also even if these ideas don't help them to predict what's going to happen next, because it's not functioning as science, they've made it up, it does give them a sense of understanding the meaning of it, mm. a way of thinking about it. And humans need that, the strange need we have to understand the world. And then I guess th- there is a third layer in a way of, of, of some kind of morality in them or or, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or, or yeah. immorality. Or, morality, yeah. yeah. One of the things that's most interesting to me about myths is it's not usually the gods who create the morality. No, it's, I guess it's humans. It's usually mm-hmm. the humans. Sometimes animals. Sometimes animals, mm-hmm. that's true. In, in, in so many myths, the gods are actually part of this complicated world and the humans are just trying to figure it out. And you get there what's called narrative ethics or situation ethics, where you just show someone dealing with a situation and let people try and figure out whether Odysseus is right or whether he's wrong. Um, in the Mahabharata, the great king Yudhishthira, he's called the king of Dharma or ethics. He spends all of his time worrying, being confused, getting angry at the gods. And at the very end of this enormous epic myth, he says, I'm not going to heaven to have my well-deserved reward if I can't bring my dog and my family who helped me get here. And the gods say, no, you can't take them. Don't be ridiculous. You can't take your dog. And he says, and I'm not going. And they send him to hell. And of course, it turns out to be a test. But the text, I think, is there saying, look, if the gods don't give you justice, you demand it. Mm. Because we are the ones who have to create morality in the human world. A very popular Swedish uh, song 20 years ago was actually, yeah. do I, am, am I allowed to take my dog to heaven if I go there? <laughs> really? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, there you go. India agrees that yeah. it's a major issue. Yes. And you should stand firm for mm. your dog. <laughs> <laughs> but which takes us to actually the, um, the fourth question that I think of, of, of listening to you is that is there, is the, um, is there a, another layer of more shall we say, archetypes like, like, like revolting against the gods or, or in a, almost a Jungian sense that, yeah. that there are 
very specific uh, narratives or, or figures or characters that are recurring in different uh, yeah. uh, in different societies, and that they represent in a way archetypical situations or, or questions or individuals. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in some ways, Jung, who's so fascinated with myth, is something that gives us an insight into the human society, un uh, human psyche universally, and through that society as well. He points out that if they're if if they're all about us trying to figure out how life works, then the story of the hero in everyone, whoever is the hero is you, trying to figure out how to overcome danger, how to save your family or community, how to find love and happiness, how to get around the wily wizard or witch who's trying to hurt you. Every story is about the self. Uh, Jung writes about this need that we have to kind of work out the soul uh, through our stories and make the right decisions and decide what we want to be and become and do. So that myth always has that kind of hidden inner, the ethical story is also the story of self-discovery and self-determination. So, and is that also a way of transferring knowledge through myth? Uh, yeah. of, of, of the noite self, know thyself. Know thyself, exactly. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's knowing yourself. A lot of modern psychology seems to be concerned with um, an understanding of your motivations, understanding what's driving you. But this is more an applied psychology that says whatever you understand, what you have to do is make a decision. You're going to have to learn how to live. And so the story is always, Paul Ricoeur, the great French philosopher, says that human minds are story-shaped. The way we think about our past and look to the future and situate ourselves at this constantly moving point where we're trying to figure out how to get towards a better future. That's basic to us. So that the myth as psychology is always teaching us how to understand ourselves as agents, as, as actors, as heroes. Um, maybe that's something we could do with more today. We have a lot of modern myths, of course, which try and do the same thing. And, and are they also, uh, are modern myths, are they in a way similar? Do you see similar patterns in a way? Or? Well, I mean, there's a great, there's a great um, interest in how myths change. So, mm. you know, what are, what, are the, what are the biggest myths? You can tell me what the Swedish ones would be at the moment. Uh, you know, in, in Hollywood or in the world of Western film and cinema and television, uh, what's popular? Detective stories about corruption, mm. right? Corruption myths and the complicated nature of justice today. All these dark psycho killer stories are interesting. And the, the, the idea that that's both about living in a morally complicated world. We need myths about that. And living in a world that's morally complicated inside of us after Freud, it, it, the psyche is not an easy thing to negotiate anymore. Mm. Well, you have this very popular series, Dexter, yeah. who actually is a serial killer, but he only kills the bad guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's almost a great fantasy that you yes. get to you get to live out all your darkest sides, mm. but they turn out to be good. Yeah. All the bad things you want to do, do them, do them, because in the end it'll save somebody. So, so that's an interesting kind of a myth story. Um, People write a lot about the Star Wars series, etc., um, and the whole fantasy genre. How that takes us into mm. tales of, you know, in in our lives we don't get to do much that's exciting, but most of us, most of the time, we love stories about people who's on whose decisions the fate of the world lies. That's our fantasy in a way, to, to for it to really matter to us uh, that what we do on Monday will actually have an impact on the world. Mm. Uh, when you compare myths cross-culturally. Mm. Um, I guess you see a lot of similarities. We spoke about Jungian archetypes. Mm. But I also guess that you see a lot of differences that are in a way culturally determined. Uh, mm. or, or do you? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, exactly. In a way, Jung fell out of fashion because he made it sound as if all the myths are going to turn out the same. Mm. And it doesn't quite work out that way, of Does, course. Doesn't. I think it doesn't. I mean, or or maybe you need to see different variations. The the Indian Ramayana, on which Diwali, the great Hindu festival, uh, is based, is a story of a brave, strong king. And brave, strong kings are very popular. Uh, kings trying to do the best for their people. King Arthur, the Arthurian myths of England are like this. Um, and I'm sure we get that that pattern coming up again and again. But you also get myths that are about kings who want to give up everything, mm -hmm. right? King or myths of kings who actually 
don't do a good job and their failure is a, is a virtue. And different cultures will choose different myths, will have the myth turn out differently. If you watch Indian films, which are uh, some love and some hate, they're interesting because you can never predict how they're going to end. At least the classic ones, mm. they've become more Hollywoodized. But the classic ones, you didn't know if the lead character is going to die or, or turn bad or anything could happen because their myth structure that they've inherited is different from ours. And that makes it exciting. You're not simply going to have the heroes get together, kiss, big you know, swell of music, the end anything could happen. And so actually it's quite exciting to look to other cultures and see how their myths vary. It reminds you that you know, life is more unknown. The structure of things is more open than we maybe normally realize. How do we then, um, uh, how, how does then the Western tragedies mm. enter to this, where, where the hero actually, Hamlet is a failed hero and he, he dies at the end and yeah. Romeo and Juliet, the lovers, don't get each other, and then uh, due to misunderstanding, even Juliet actually, co or I think Romeo commits suicide, yeah. and then Juliet commits suicide. They yeah. don't even die, yeah. they suicide due to misunderstanding. Are these also myths, in a sense, of, of legends, or are, they or are they much modern, in a sense, that you could say, mm -hmm. no, Shakespeare doesn't come, that, that's more refined tragedy. But, but then, on, of course, then you have King Oedipus, which is also a kind of, everybody tries to do their best, and it all oh, ends good. up in terrible failure. Yeah. It's a very good question, the, the tragic world, because, I mean, mostly we think of myth in the ones we know popularly in the West as being fairly cheery. They're about, you know, adventure and usually success. Um, and then you see tragedy, as you say, the Shakespearean tragedies, which are usually tragedies of the psyche or some subtle human failing. They're about the individual. And so Shakespeare is seen as a modern, exactly as you say, because he's an individualist in some ways. So we see that as modern and the old pattern as different. But you're right, there are these strains of myth which are globally super tragic. They're hyper tragedies. So for instance, the Norse mythology of the, what we call Viking mythology in England, when I first read them as a kid, that at the end, they end in Ragnarok. Mm. Everything's destroyed. And I remember thinking, you can't have a myth that ends that way. What does this mean? Um, you know, it's a King Arthur, of course. It's also another tragic, almost quite modern myth. It's a myth of the failure of, of, a, of a utopian society. Yeah, and, and also that actually, that his wife falls in love with Lancelot and, 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 and their love story is also a very touching one. We have the same thing with Tristan and Isolde, I guess, yes. which is also like, uh, but in a sense that, uh, what I just said in a, is a repetition maybe, but everybody seems to do their best, but it all ends up in failure. It's, but, but what do we learn from that? Is that, that <laughs> there is no meaning in life? Or <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, okay, maybe there are two different kinds of tragic myth mm. here. One where the heroes are still heroic. Yes. And then the message is about effort, effort, even if it fails. The, the story of King Arthur is about what Don Quixote, chaotic um, virtue, idealism, despite the reality. And the, the point of King Arthur is not that his, 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 his reign ends, it's that for a brief period he creates Camelot. Mm, so, the, you know, in the 60s the with Kennedy, we is, still speak yeah, of Camelot, yeah, exactly. Yes. For one brief shining moment that yeah. was here in Camelot. So those are still hero stories. The ones that, for instance, Wagner loves are the ones that are just utter disasters, mm. almost all the way down the line. You know, Siegfried and Brunhilde, it, it all goes wrong. He becomes bitter, she becomes bitter, everybody dies, and then the world of the gods burns and history is destroyed. No access to the divine ever again, done. Do we have similar uh, tragic endings in other cultures' myths that they... Is, or is that something very more, much more Western? Because now we all, yeah. all, this, all the examples we gave, although they were from different historical periods, are all in a way of in the Western cultural hemisphere. Yeah, that's a good question. I can't think of any offhand, although the story is complicated because many myths, if you look at the whole myth, it's curiously tragic. So the story of, uh, of Odysseus, the, mm. the Odyssey, Ulysses, he goes on his journey, gets lost, he has adventures, but he finds his way home. And we know about the bit where he comes home to Ithaca. There's a version of this where he's discontented. For some reason or other, he has to go away again and he leaves mm. and never returns. The Ramayana, the great story of the King Rama in India, he, his wife is stolen, he goes, he fights, he gets her back 
And at the end, he ends up having to send her away because everyone thinks she might have been sexually compromised while she was kidnapped. So there's a tragic ending in which she actually ends up rejecting him and immolating herself. The bit that we remember is the happy bit. Often many of the myths actually have a longer, broader, long, slightly tragic arc. So why that is is very curious. I don't know. Maybe there's a kind of realism. Maybe that myths... Because they are sounding boards for the world, they have to reflect reality. Maybe they're always giving, reminding us that there is a, a sadness and a darkness to each mm. life. You spoke about the older uh, Bollywood films and their different endings, and then you yeah. saw that they are getting more Hollywoodized. Mm. In a sense, will our myths converge and become more, <laughs> uh, in a sense, more homogeneous and then thus also even more boring because yeah. they will just have the same uh, <laughs> narrative pattern yeah. at the end? Or, or, or will the myths, uh, just a final, uh, as a final question, do you think that we will still have a diversity of myths? Or? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know. The global, the globalization of the world, we talk about the McDonald'sization, we're all, all going to end up eating mm. the same stuff. You're right, it would be a tragedy if we end up watching exactly the same stories over and over again. We can keep going back to different histories, but in the end, will it become a blank, bland mass? I don't know. Maybe it's an encouragement to be more imaginative. Uh, and let history give us, keep giving us new stories, keep making genuinely new, diverse myths. But I guess on the other hand, uh, although you see some kind of homogenization, you always also find subcultures and, yeah. and an interest of yeah. differentiate and say that, no, we are not like them, we have our own myths and yeah. so... Exactly. Maybe that's, I mean, and that ties into things like funding for the arts. You know, it shouldn't just be Hollywood making films. It should be everybody making films so that genuinely new, fresh, interesting, striking stories can keep coming to life so that we get, as you say, these subcultures which are, keep it vibrant and diverse. Much younger, I thought that indie films meant Indian films, so not <laughs> independent. So that's, that's maybe what we will get, independent Indian Indian, which are happening actually. Yes. India, Indians don't, often don't like the word Bollywood, um, but there are lots of other independent cinemas, cinema groups that go with the different languages and regions of India that, have, that very much have their own stories to tell. So I guess we'll still have a diversity of myths. Yeah, I hope that we will. I think that I think that if globalization functions the way it ought to, it will keep pumping new life and energy into the story-making machine, which is human culture, and not homogenize it into the, the myth of the world. Dr. Fraser, thank you so much. Thank you.